Hello. Uh, wow, this, is, this isn't something I've done in, uh, much of in the last couple of years, so it's fantastic to see you all here. Um, I am Paul Lewis, the president of the Architecture League, uh, and this is nearly uh, the last public lecture I get the pleasure of introducing as my term uh, as president comes to a close this week, but this is perhaps one of the lectures that I'm most looking forward to. Uh, Kashef Chowdhury, co-founder and lead of the DACA-based firm Ur Urbana is here in person, and we, we are all in for a treat. This is a hybrid lecture somewhat comparable to the recording of a television program where there's a relatively small but increasingly growing audience. Great to see everyone here uh, and a much larger audience online. So welcome to all. Uh, and this means that the people in the room uh, need to be uh, twice as loud and perhaps ask twice as many questions. Uh, uh, and that said, questions, of course, are welcome uh, from those of you online and please use the Q&A function. We all know this far too well at this point. Uh, before we, be, uh, we begin, some thanks. Uh, this program is supported in part by the public funds from New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature. The event is organized by the Architectural League of New York and co-presented by the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture at the Cooper Union. Uh, the Architectural League thanks its members whose support makes this uh, program and others possible. Uh, as this is the final current work lecture of the season, I wanna personally thank uh, the League's program director, Anne Rieselbach, for curating and bringing to fruition yet another fascinating series during this endless pandemic roller coaster. And also thank uh, Rafi Lehman for his attention to all the details necessary to make this happen. Although Kasef Chowdhury is an architect working in Bangladesh and his work is highly attentive to the specifics of that landscape, uh, I think it would be an error to see his work's value as constrained to that geography. Uh, he is an extraordinary architect. In my opinion, uh, one of the most interesting and creative anywhere in the world who, as you will see, has produced exceptional buildings, often with very limited means. Uh, this is an opinion shared by an increasing number of award programs. Uh, Kashef is the recipient of the Aga Khan Award, the RIBA International Prize, and his work has been featured at the Venice Biennial. Uh, currently, an exhibition of his work, which originated at the Aida's Gallery in Berlin, has traveled to four other European cities, and open today, yes, open today at the Luxembourg Center for Architecture. We are very glad uh, that he is here. Uh, you might ask, why is there such a level of interest? And I'd argue that he's invented novel ways of engaging climate change, specifically flooding, cyclones, and population migration with buildings that transcend these uh, pragmatics producing substantive and sublime spaces rich with nuance and vitality for inhabitants who are uh, more often typically qualified by things associated with poverty. Moreover, in one of the densest countries in the world, he is rethinking ruralism and how it can be a critical model of living with nature that could inform inhabitation across the world. So on behalf of the Architectural League, it is my great pleasure to welcome Kashef Chowdhury. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the Architectural League for inviting me here today. Um, before I take you to Bengal, where most of my work is, I'd like to give you a little context of where we are. So we are in between India and the country Myanmar, uh, you can see, and diagonally opposite the globe um, to where we are now. Um, okay, so um, this is where I work, but basically on the north is this Himalayan mountain range, which is the highest and the longest range in the world, and then one of the largest oceans, the Indian Ocean, moving into the Bay of Bengal here. So as you can imagine, a lot of water drains through here, which is parts of India and Pakistan, 
but most of it drains through here, which is the largest delta in the world. And Bangladesh is basically um, host to three major river systems. One that comes from here, which is the mighty Ganges, and then the Brahmaputra, which originates in the plains of Tibet uh, from the glacier waters and drains here again. And this river currently is flooding. So at the moment, nearly 100 people have lost their lives for flooding in this region. And as we speak, uh, nearly millions of people have um, been displaced. We also have, this is a very complex weather system because of this funnel shaped kind of um, Bay of Bengal. And so we have cyclones, which are known as hurricanes in this country. They form in the bay and move inland and unfortunately make landfall quite often in Bangladesh itself. And so that's um, also happening with increasing frequency with the changing climate. The um, plate from Australia, which traveled thousands of millions of years ago, have collided with the Eurasian plate. And these are areas of seismic activity here. And uh, according to scientists, a major uh, earthquake is about to happen. I know this all sounds very um, negative, but that's what it is. And uh, our work sort of uh, tries to address some of these uh, issues in, in the most uh, effective way we could uh, think of. So I grew up next to one of these mighty rivers. Um, and uh, I think my memories of, of those places, of, of those rivers, of those waters, I think they guide uh, me in, in whatever work and uh, landscape we work in. And I think it's very important uh, for us to understand that landscape is just not a result of, um, of climate or, or nature, but also how we look at it. So uh, we have tried to work all over the country. Uh, we work in rural areas quite a lot, uh, but also in urban areas. And um, the first project is, is a set of raised villages, as I call them. Uh, we started work on this project. It's a pro bono project. We do a lot of work with, without fees uh, because the client is not afford to, uh, it's not able to afford the fees for us. And so um, this is one of them. And as you can see, the country is a country of 700 rivers. And all the blue lines that you see are the rivers. And so as many or many more bridges and uh, ways to sort of uh, reach from to these remote areas. Um, it's, it's a difficult terrain in that way. But as I was saying, the major three major river systems, some of the largest in the world, this is the Ganges, which comes in like this and drains through here. This is the Brahmaputra, which comes from Tibet, as I said, and this is the Surma Meghna River network. Uh, these are huge rivers. And um, so we work, for this project, we work within the river itself. This is a picture that I have taken um, in a normal situation. This is not flooding. This is just in the rainy season. Now, throughout my lecture, I will be using terms which are new to you. Rainy season is actually a season in our country. It lasts for uh, three months. It's, it's a distinct season. So during that season, as you can see, the question might be, whether it's the water in the landscape or is it the, the, the land in the water? So, um, so we work um, mainly in the river system here within the river itself, which is um, very quiet. As it comes down from the mountains, it becomes slow and begins to um, deposit alluvial soil. And you can see here that the sandbanks are already beginning to form and then slowly um, they, they take height and shape. And people come to live here because these are landless people and they have no deeds or um, title to their land. So they don't leave uh, when there's flooding. So they continue to live here during floods um, uh, and sometimes totally submerged uh, in eight to 10 feet of water. 
This is the river where we are working. Uh, it's about seven miles in width. This is from our drier season, but during the rains, this will all be water. And so uh, people living here would be in a sea of water. So um, our project was to sort of understand how we could help uh, the situation. Now, the general idea would be to raise these houses above the level of floods, which is about eight feet, but that doesn't work. Um, there have been many proposals. People continue to do this, but it doesn't work because sometimes this, these river islands, they just vanish overnight because of, of the heavy um, current. And also because uh, the foundation would need to be quite deep, up to 20 or 30 feet, and that would beat the purpose of making affordable housing um, for these poor people. And the other problem, of course, is cattle, because that's all they have, that's all their possession. And to, to, if, you, if you look at uh, the kind of setting in a village, this is probably the house or the hut they would be living in with a bed and a kind of a living space. There would be a kitchen and another bed in that hut. But the most important hut is the one for the cattle, because just like us, the cows and the goats, they cannot uh, uh, be in the rain and they do fall sick. So um, they, they don't like to leave the cattle behind when the flood comes in. So to solve all of that, the idea was to raise the entire settlement above uh, on a plinth. And that was our project. So we didn't start this. There were other people who had been yeah. doing this, but uh, apparently with rectangular squarish forms, the, the corners mm -hmm. began to break and then totally disappear altogether. So um, I used to go there in the beginning in a seaplane because it's so remote. And uh, I could see from the air that there were these comet shaped islands that were forming. So as the water sort of, sort of uh, went out, it left these trails. And so that was our idea to sort of mimic that and uh, create a kind of a teardrop shaped island so the water can pass uh, like this. And it's a kind of a dig and mount uh, approach. So one digs a, a pond uh, in the middle and uses this to sort of raise the entire area where uh, people can move. And also it's an interesting project because um, it's a self-help uh, kind of a project. So the villages are, are paid to move their own houses, to make the uh, plant itself. So it, it's, it's a very interesting project in that way. And as you can see, um, the flood level would be this, and the sort of plant helps to keep them dry. And this is how we sort of work. There's no GPS or uh, anything. So it's a very flat landscape. Uh, it's difficult to, um, and so we have this very simple method of sort of giving a layout. One of our architects is working there. And so this is the pond that they're digging. The pond is taking shape, green returns, and then life returns. This is how it looks in the landscape, in the flat landscape and um, it becomes a normal village uh, after use and after living in it. But this is what happens during a flood. So the water comes and, uh, and here you can see that the plinth that I was talking about, it allows for the people to sort of, uh, for example, they're drying jute fibers here and uh, the cattle, they can be brought up to that plinth as well. And uh, the rainwater harvest in the central pond helps with the clean water uh, for all sorts of purposes. And uh, this is um, a picture which shows people just beginning to move into these areas. And then uh, we also have a school here. So the question might be, if, is this architecture? I think anything that touches lives, human or animal, I think that's architecture. And uh, this could be landform or landscape, but this is definitely something we'd like to get ourselves involved with. Um, close to this project is um, a learning center uh, for the same client, which is an NGO friendship. And uh, we um, were given a site very close to the river it's about a mile from the river. And uh, 
it's a very flat landscape as in the rest of the area that we work in. Very moist, very humid. And so this is um, the site as we found it. So another term, which is, this is a low lying land, which means flood water will come in here. And um, so our challenge was to build with flood protection within the given very low budget. And the, the normal way of doing this would be this. And this is what we designed in the beginning. And uh, we were uh, over budget by a factor of two, which means we were double uh, the cost. And uh, the project didn't happen. So one day I was looking at this and I realized our project isn't here, it's here. That's the only way. And so that's what we did. We built on the existing low line, kind of low elevation and protected this complex with an earth berm or a compacted earth embankment. Uh, this was a very risky proposal. This has not been done in 2000 years. 2000 years ago, there's a city uh, close by this, which is in ruins, but it was again protected by this kind of an embankment. And um, the, my client, uh, who is also a very good friend, she said, uh, Runa Khan, and Runa said, uh, you know, I will go with you, but this is a risk because nobody else is willing. Uh, the, her office, other people, whomever she showed the drawings, they said, this is very risky, it doesn't work. Uh, you cannot do this, uh, but we did. And um, so when this came, the attendant problem of water getting collected within the areas of the embankment, and uh, we, we introduced a series of tanks and pools to collect that water. And we also introduced um, a kind of a, a large tanks to hold sewage because it was, everybody just pumps sewage into the flood water when it comes. Um, but uh, we, we, we introduced large tanks and we have a holding capacity for three months, which we don't need, we need, we need it for a month, but we have a holding capacity for twice that amount. And uh, just to make sure that we do not pollute. And so basically it consists of two blocks. The first block in the center is a reception pavilion around which are arranged these uh, rooms uh, for discussion and training, et cetera, and offices, a meditation, prayer space. The second block similarly has a kind of a pavilion, which is a dining pavilion, and around which are the dormitories and living spaces. And so we try to study the, the solid and the void kind of spaces to make sure that, because now we were literally uh, submerged. So uh, this sunken kind of uh, structure meant that we were not getting enough air into the spaces. So we had to break up the spaces to make sure the natural ventilation did occur. And the resultant elevation works very well because uh, with, with the surrounding villages, it's merged very well, excepting for the water tower and, and some other facilities, uh, very small towers. But um, the main uh, building was introverted as a result of this approach. Um, and uh, the, as you can see, these are the elevations with uh, breathable breathing walls uh, so that air can pass through even those walls as well. But this is what happens during a flood. And four years ago, a flood did take place and we had water to five feet above our flow level. And it stayed there for about a month. And uh, that was our test. And uh, we did uh, pass that test because uh, it was dry in this area. And uh, so uh, we were able to do this project at half the cost, uh, at least. Uh, than it would have uh, cost us if we did raise the entire project. But the other problem was controlling quality. So this is what I saw. Uh, this is a photograph I took when I went to the site on the first day. And um, as you can imagine, it was uh, quite scary. And uh, I, we set up a very strict regimen of quality control, quality uh, control of the quality of bricks, which comes from a manufacturer just a mile away. Everything is local, local uh, craftsmen, local people. Uh, but um, I'm quite happy with the result in the sense um, our people were constantly traveling to the site. It's, it's a remote area. It takes nearly a day to go there. 
but uh, we were there quite often and we were able to control this quality. So the other sort of reference uh, or inspiration comes from some of the Buddhist monasteries, the ruins of Buddhist monasteries in the region, because our project had become introverted by, not by choice, but as it happened. So then I looked into uh, these monasteries which um, were in the region and they had this mom cells overlooking, for example, this is an eight feet, eight feet by eight feet cell, which overlooked a kind of a courtyard here. And we sought to transform this into this. And um, by introducing a kind of a thermal mass on the roof, we were also able to uh, sort of control solar heat gain um, uh, for this naturally ventilated complex, uh, where uh, again, temperatures are rising, record heat. Um, and by using this pavilion forms and broken forms, we were able to sort of bring in um, this breeze and, um, and, and sort of take away the, the, the humidity. And also, of course, helped with merging this complex with the, the rest of the, uh, the villages and, and the landscape. And of course, the, the introduction of pools and gardens and corridors and shadows helped to sort of bring a variety into a space uh, because people here would come here for a, a week or so. And so it was important that we had a lot of interaction spaces, uh, movements. Uh, for example, this is a training pavilion where people, uh, women mostly sit on the floor and discuss um, you know, about women's rights and um, childbirth, hygiene, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, as I said, a lot of uh, discussion areas out in the open. The entire complex is built of brick, uh, walls, floors. That's the uh, dining pavilion. This is one of the dorms. One of the rooms. So very basic because we also didn't have budget for it. And also because we were inspired by this monastic quality of those, of those ruins that we encountered. That's the dining pavilion. Now the courtyard, the reception pavilion. So this is what I call a green plan in the sense, um, almost the entire site is covered by green, the, the white spaces that you see. This is a pond, so this is water again. So, um, so this is how it looks from the, uh, it's, it's not Photoshopped or anything. So this is how sort of it sort of merges with the landscape. Um, you may be aware of um, the Rohingya refugees that have come into Bangladesh since 2018. And we were asked to sort of look into the possibility of making some prototype schools for their children. And um, this is in the southernmost tip of the country, uh, next to Myanmar. Uh, they just crossed the river to come into Bangladesh um, because of the oppression there. And this is what it is. They, they are all over the world, but mostly in Bangladesh, more than a million now. And uh, I'm sure you've seen this uh, photographs before. And so this is the largest refugee camp in the world, um, in Kutupalong. Uh, just here, I think there are about 450,000 people in here alone. And um, we were given three days to design this prototype and three weeks to make it. And uh, the restriction was, uh, it couldn't be any um, permanent materials. So no bricks or concrete or steel or glass. Uh, that was a government restriction. So we chose bamboo because it grows abundantly in the region. And so it's all bamboo, including stairs, floors, roofs, everything. And uh, the idea was to achieve two things. One, uh, generosity of space, given the limitation of the space that we had, but also to make sure there's a little bit of a privacy because that's the rarest commodity in a refugee camp, as you can imagine. And so um, it's a circle within a circle. This is the classroom space. 
but it is in, you know, in, encased in a kind of a bamboo kind of a lattice structure, uh, which sort of screens off the dust and noise uh, from, the re from the road and from the rest of the, the camp. So that's a section. And uh, again, it was interesting. This, this was also a pro bono project for us. Uh, it was interesting to work with the refugees themselves because the idea was they will build their own school and they were paid to do that. And, um, and very basic means, as you can imagine. Uh, it was, there were no nails used, all tied knots. And uh, this is a layout. And uh, that's how we get the layout for the circle. And uh, people, you know, worked with all earnestly. And the children were quite excited because uh, this came about a year after they had come here, before their first school in that area. And that's where it is in, in, in the camp. And um, so they have now repeated this prototype in many places. Here they're making another one. So that, that's the bamboo screen I was talking about. And inside it sort of opens up, it lets the sun in, even the rain and the elements. And um, well, there's screen uh, to make sure that direct sunlight does not enter. And the stair becomes a kind of a play element for the children. This is the upper level. So I was just talking to Paul and, and to say that we don't only work with low budget projects, we work with standard projects as well. So this is a campus building we completed just before the pandemic um, in, in, in Dhaka itself. Uh, this is a project we're doing in the north of the country for the Samdani Art Foundation who uh, hosts uh, the Dhaka Art Summit, which is the most important voice in that region. And this is uh, a, an art campus and a sculpture park where some very famous artists are scheduled to uh, come and work. And uh, this is nearing completion uh, about in about three months. We also have done a series of mosques, uh, five mosques, uh, each different with a different material, different approach um, in, in different uh, settings. This, for example, is in the urban area and uh, in a very tight plot. So we went up and um, uh, it was designed for 2,600 people. And I think it's now it's used by four and a half thousand. This is in a very remote uh, village. This is a project um, we did uh, myself and uh, in partnership with Marina Tabassum um, uh, from 97 onwards, the independence monument for the country and also the museum of independence for the country. This is where we live. Uh, it's an apartment, but uh, we call it a pavilion apartment because it's all open. Um, whether this works, since 2008, I can tell you that it, it's very hot um, living there. But before that, it was very comfortable. I, from 2001 to 2008, it was all right. But since then, climate change. So, um, so we were invited to Venice by Alejandro Aravena and his team to sort of, uh, and we chose these projects um, to sort of uh, talk about what we were doing in that part of the world. And uh, it was a very nice space in the uh, Giardini and um, here. Um, and so the idea was to create a glass labyrinth. Glass because it's the material from Venice, the Venetian glass. Um, not the Murano glass, but of course, just the modern glass. But um, to, and to create a kind of an inner space where the display of the projects are. And so one crosses the labyrinth to go there because through the glass one can see clearly but cannot approach that was our uh, idea to express because that's that's what we do we know what we want we we have our designs we have our projects but it's very difficult to get them done or to achieve what we want to do and so uh, so one crosses this difficult space to go get to that inner kind of area
So this is uh, what it looked like with the glass working as planes. And through the glass, you could see uh, the installation. Of course, th that was the idea to sort of, to express the difficulty of getting there. And inside the displays were like little plants because we, we take a lot of time sort of nurturing our projects which grow just like plants. And that was the idea to sort of express our effort in sort of raising these projects. Cyclones are like hurricanes, as I said, in this country. And uh, they are increasing in frequency. And uh, anybody you know, who is aware of climate change knows that this is one of the things that's also hitting the United States and uh, with more frequency. So our project is just on the bay of Bengal. And it started with the cyclone Sidr. It's a, it's a major cyclone with um, hit Bangladesh in 2007. So cyclones form like this here, and then they move inland like this. Sometimes they go to India, but unfortunately, most of the time they make landfall in Bangladesh. And this is an actual image of the cyclone Sidr I just talked about. Um, and, and as you can see, it's nearly the width of the country, a few hundred miles in, in width. And um, it made landfall at midnight on November 15th with maximum recorded uh, wind speeds of above 170 miles per hour. We lost 10,000 plus people and innumerable animal lives. And this is how it moved inland. I was here and in my studio in Dhaka and by the next morning, uh, I was getting reports of, of the devastation that was taking place over there and um, my, from my friends who are photographers and journalists. And I, de I decided I didn't want to be comfortable in my office. And I, I invited my colleagues to join me. And so three of my colleagues and myself, four of us, we um, went to a place which is here. It's about 130 miles from Dhaka, but it took us 13 hours to get there because the bridges had just disappeared. And we took a boat, a country boat, it's a small boat, uh, we lived in it for four days, four nights, uh, 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 and we followed, we traced the path of the cyclone as it went, and also the areas that were uh, affected. And we tried to understand firsthand what happened. And, and I, I also work as a photographer, and so I took photographs, and one of my um, colleagues, he made uh, recordings, um, uh, in a passive way, in the sense we didn't interview anybody because there was a lot of trauma, as you can imagine. But we just made those recordings of people having conversations. And um, for example, here used to be um, kind of a forest, dense forest. And this was a very typical kind of scenario over there because of the, the wooden houses and the tasked houses, or of course, were no match for the power of the cyclone. So if we can imagine it's midnight, the power is out, it's totally dark, and then the water has come in, the tidal surge is 21 feet high, and it's an endless sea, and there's this howling sound of the wind going up to 170 miles an hour, and there's this thunderstorm lightning and rain pouring. And on top of that, people were talking about demons in the sky. And we went to several places and they just kept on saying the same thing, demons in the sky, fire in the sky. And I thought this was from trauma. But then we realized there was really fire in the sky. The wind speed was so high, it had caught fire. And we actually saw burnt trees and burnt houses. And so it's, it's a very difficult situation. I mean, how people can survive this is, is, is a miracle. And so there were survivors. For example, this little girl, she was five in 2007. She's looking to where her house was. She has lost everyone in her family. And this, this is the kind of, I didn't want to do a third world photography. We are not showing any faces. We are standing as witness with those affected. And we are standing behind them. And um, 
So this boy, for example, is pointing to where he tied himself. This is 21 feet above where we were standing when we measured it. And he tied himself there and he saved himself. And uh, this person, for example, wasn't making any sense when we saw him. He, he had lost his family, um, his wife and children, his parents, his brother's family. And um, th this person is standing where his house used to be. There used to be a forest here, just like this. And the only remnants of his house are these little things. And he was saved by the intelligence of his wife. So as soon as she saw the water coming and she took off her clothes, uh, she, she, she wore a sari, if you know, uh, this long clothes which they wrap around. So she said, take off your clothes. And she tied herself, uh, her husband and a little baby to the, the highest branch of the tree she could find and they saved themselves while all of the neighbors perished. So um, when we came back to Dhaka, we realized, I mean, we couldn't work for a week, but we realized we were not an aid agency. We couldn't do anything about this, but the only thing we could do was design. And uh, there are many cyclone shelters in Bangladesh, uh, about two and a half thousand. Uh, but based on our own experiences firsthand, uh, we realized there were things we could do to make it better in some ways. And that's what we tried to do. So one of the first things was to create a kind of a landmark. So the people know where it is. It doesn't look like a normal building. People always realize that that is a special building. And in terms of, a, in times of a cyclone or a warning, people can easily and quickly go to that place. So the design is very simple. It's a kind of a cruciform shape uh, with a ramp sort of wrapped around the building. And, and then we have this automatically forming uh, kind of light ventilation wells, which sort of protect the um, inner uh, kind of building from wind and high hydraulic pressure. So in normal times, this is used as a clinic, day clinic. Uh, this is the clinic on the lower floor, on the ground floor. And on the upper level is a primary school of three classrooms with a gathering space and a teacher's room. In both the floors, we have this uh, storerooms in which the furniture can be taken in times of a cyclone and people come and stand because they have to be here only for four or six hours so they come and stand and um, and the roof is used um, as a play space in normal times the reason we have this ramp and this roof space is because of the cattle we realized from our visit that they bring the cattle with them as i said this is all they have so they don't like to leave it behind but when they bring it in, they cannot take it into the shelter. So, so our uh, proposal was to sort of uh, bring the cattle on top and be saved from the tidal surge. And again, the, the, the other thing was glass breaks because everything is flying. The flying debris consists of uh, houses, entire houses, uh, you know, tents and, and uh, trees. So they come and hit the glass and it breaks and the howling sound sort of comes inside it, it traumatizes the children. So uh, our solution was to uh, make it smaller into kind of egg crate devices uh, in concrete and recess them and then have them doubly protected by the concrete ramp that sort of wraps the building. This would be in a typical situation. So the cattle can be saved on the roof and we have high ceiling height to reduce the feeling of claustrophobia as much as possible. So we had a design, but we didn't have a client and we had, didn't have the funds. And uh, I made a book out of the photographs we took and tried to sell it to raise the funds and we failed miserably. And um, so there was an exhibition of our work in Dhaka in 2013 and we kept this project and in the, in the, in the client, in the description, in the client, it said client search. And there was a group from Luxembourg, again, Luxembourg visiting, and they found this to be interesting. And they said, what, what does it mean, client search? And I said, we don't have a client, we're searching for a client. And uh, they said, would you be interested to take this exhibition to Luxembourg and try to raise funds there? I said, why not? And off it went there. And because of this person, Mark Elvinger, we were able to raise funds for, uh, to build one prototype, which is 280,000 euros. Uh, because this building is entirely concrete. Uh, it is half the cost of the other 
public uh, or government funded uh, projects that are out there. And the work started with all enthusiasm. And as you can see, um, quite horrifying again. So um, local contractor, local people, local techniques. And uh, again, we had to set up a kind of a strict regimen to sort of control that quality. They have never before built a concrete building, let's decide a fine finished or a fair faced kind of a concrete surface. And this is how it started to sort of rise. And as you can see, uh, not very good. And then of course it became better as we trained the, the workmen. Uh, in my office, we have engineers. We do not give out any engineering service. We do not do a structural design, but we have a number of engineers for just things like this. Again, this was a pro bono project uh, because we wanted to contribute our fees for, for, for the building of this uh, first prototype. And uh, so our engineers helped to train them as well. And it's all concrete, including the floor. And the floor is just polished concrete. And that was uh, the first day of school. So this is a lower class. There are benches in other classes. That's the recessed window we talked about. The roof. So, so this is the, uh, the idea that we pursued to have a kind of a form that is, and it, in the area it's now known as a cyclone building. And I think it works quite well because they know where it is and they can get to it quickly. And this is how it is in the landscape. So it took us 10 years from 2007 to 2017 to sort of build it. Um, and since then, uh, in the clinic, more than 50,000 patients have been served and nearly 300 uh, persons have been saved. When I say saved, it's because um, this building stands firmly on the divide between life and death. If they don't get to this place, they will definitely perish. If the cyclone is anywhere near where this uh, project is. So it's, it's, not a, it's not an if, it's not a kind of a shelter. It, it is a life-saving device. So the last project is a hospital, again, in the remote area, close to the border with India. And as I said, if, if you know, there are many naysayers in the world who say climate change is, is not real, all they need to do is come here. And they will, this is where our project is. All these places are already flooding with rising oceans. And this is what will happen when uh, the waters rise in, in by 2050. All of this area, all of these areas will be underwater, uh, millions of people. And uh, this is where we are. It's uh, in, again in a very rural kind of a village setting with a canal passing. All of this area, these were agricultural lands when I first went there in 2011 or 12. And now this is what you see. This is the water that has come in. The, it, it, the arable land is no longer usable and they do shrimp farming here now. And the water underground is also salty, seawater. And they cannot drink the water underground. So they, they, they have uh, some ponds from where the local people collect buy water. Everybody buys water in that area. So it's a country, as I said, it's a country full of water. And here there is not a drop to drink. And so we realized that for a hospital, it needs to be an efficient machine. And that's what we tried to achieve, the highest efficacy possible. And so in the front is this OPD or outpatient, and then the main hospital here and the residential area here. So this is how we got the land. This, is, this was donated for the hospital. So, and we kept the pond that was there in the, in the front, but there was a need to divide this OPD from the, the, the rest of the hospital spaces. And instead of putting up a barrier kind of uh, in the linear site, we introduced this canal which sort of uh, takes all the water, but also separates uh, uh, zones while affording visual continuity. 
So as it sort of uh, crisscrosses the entire campus, it collects water and uh, again, uh, allows for this continuity to happen. So people from different zones can share the same courtyards. And on the upper level are the conference room, the library, and at the back of the staff quarters and some doctors um, quarters at the back as well. And so the entire rainwater falling in the campus is collected and it's shallow for safety. And so, as, as I said, we, we made sure that we don't lose a drop of water. Everything is collected here. There's a tank at the back, which we introduced, and there's this naturally forming pond at the front. So we collect this. Um, and we studied the direction of wind flow for uh, natural ventilation to make sure that energy uh, consumption is low as possible. So this building's turn, not because of any formal reasons, but to catch the direction, to catch the wind, and, and also to make sure that the wind sort of moves into these courtyards and into those wards and other spaces on this side. So next to pools were situated this pavilion. This, for example, is the dining area for the doctors, the residential areas, so by using this microclimatic cooling, but also because of this changing climate, there's a lot of rain, there's increasing rainfall in the area and, and there are floods, flash floods. And the same canal sort of helps to take away the water quickly uh, to avoid uh, water logging. And this is the pond where the water is collected, the extra water is collected. And so, as I said, we followed a strict kind of a zoning pattern. This is the main entry going directly to the residential area at the back uh, here is the outpatient and then the main hospital. And at the end, we introduced a kind of a uh, naturally ventilated service corridor. If, if you have seen reports during the, the COVID-19, you have seen doctors or, you know, corridors, but double loaded. And they were usually always enclosed. And I, I sense that is it's a problem because you have germ buildup, bacterial growth, etc. So in this hospital, all of the corridors are single loaded. There's always a kind of a courtyard or something on one side to make sure that uh, there is no buildup uh, or cross contamination at all. And in this, that was in this line, but here, this is the public, this inpatient, the restricted areas, and at the back, the services. That's the service corridor I talked about, but it's separated from the main building. So the light and um, air can sort of get into the wards here as well. And those areas which are in wind shadow, we introduce uh, operating rooms and mandatory air conditioned spaces. And so as the forms were sort of turning, the courtyards tended to sort of lose their shape, but we tried to make sure that they remained orthogonal for, so that it's not disorientating. And so for example, if one stands here, this is a kind of a rectangle completed by these various forms. And this one here is another rectangle. But this resulted in surprising forms, which we retained. And the entire campus is again uh, built of locally handmade uh, bricks. Uh, the wood is also locally uh, sourced from uh, uh, approved uh, forests. Uh, this is mahogany, and there are some tiles. And this is the uh, and the floors are um, polished concrete. And so that's it. That's the palette of materials. And we studied um, uh, light and ventilation in detail using large scale wooden models, which we uh, made um, in the studio and made changes to them as, as the design progressed. And so the idea was to create an internal landscape to sort of echo the landscape that's outside, the landscape of the Delta and, and the rivers. And so that it's easier for people from the villages to come here because this is probably the first uh, kind of a solid building uh, they will encounter. And so it was important that it was acceptable to them. And, uh, and using that same water to sort of connect to them as well. And the idea to use space as relief, because we understand that um, once critical medical care has been taken care of as one is recovering, uh, architectural spaces do uh, matter. 
And so the idea was to create calm and quiet spaces as much as possible um, within uh, the areas of the campus. And um, all spaces, as I said, are uh, naturally ventilated, benefit from reflected sunlight, reflected from the courtyard. And uh, the width of the corridors help to sort of cut out the sun and also uh, protect from driving rain. Used um, impromptu uses. And this is uh, the, one of the residential areas. So in conclusion, if, if we are to talk about care, I think uh, it's two sides of the same coin, the care for humanity and the care for our nature. And um, after decades of this star system and so-called signature architecture, I think we have come to a point when we realize that we have a much greater responsibility than just, um, just thinking about design as we understand it. And after 2000 years or 4,000 years of aesthetics, I think we need to come up with a new aesthetic. This is an aesthetic of responsibility. And uh, we, instead of just information, we need information, but more than information, we, under, we need knowledge and not just our knowledge, but worldly knowledge, the knowledge of others and the wisdom of others and the experience of others. Maybe we can then combine all together because in 120 years, none of us will be here. Will be, we will be replaced by a new set of people. But uh, what will they talk, say about our projects that we leave for them? Um, whether uh, we have been responsible or whether we had been critical to our response to the various challenges, especially those challenges with climate that we face today. Thank you very much. You get to move chairs. Um, thank you. That was more than that was even better than I thought it was going to be. So, <laughs> um, I, I I have a lot of questions, but one of the things that I was really struck by is the way in which you maintain a kind of an optimism despite the kind of rather extreme problems, right? Um, and you seem to be constantly kind of rethinking what the agency of the architect is and, each, and not, not just as a general trajectory and with the kind of question of this, um, the role of care, the aesthetics of responsibility, but also tactically relative to each project. I'm curious if that was a conscious kind of reflection that, you've gone through over the 20, uh, 20 uh, 25 years 26, almost, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, of the practice. It, it, have you constantly thought about rethinking the agency of what you do, what your office does? How is it tactical? Is it intentional? Just curious if you can talk specifically about what is the role of the architect and how have you thought about that? So, so I was a photographer before I was, a, I was an architect and I think that helped me a lot because uh, I, well, I did street photography and documentary photography, which meant we had to be there with my friends, you know, other photographers, we were working, but we had to be in situ. Mm -hmm. We had to be out there uh, talking to people, uh, interacting with people, trying to understand what the, what the situation was and then take the photograph. I, I sensed at one stage that architects were quite different. They weren't, you know, stuck in their studio, so to speak, and they were designing and formed. And, and so, uh, of course, spaces, I, I, I mean, I, I, to, be, to be sure, they were less out there than the photographers. Then came art, because I'm, I'm super interested in art and I try to follow what's happening. But if, I don't know, I, I hope there are not many artists here, but I think art has been hijacked today by galleries and, and museums because it has to you have to be on a kind of an avenue to be an artist you're not going to, you're not going to be discovered today that, that, that's gone so the real artist i think uh, is difficult today and um and i thought we art, architects should not do this 
They, they don't need agents. They don't need terrorists. They can just do their thing. And, and, and they can do their own research and come up with their own proposals. And that's what they should do. So instead of relying on publications, networking, what have you, I think architects are much better off in that way. And our art does not hang on a wall. And I think we're better off for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think those two things um, help me to understand that our uh, sort of task, our challenge, we are charged with the task of, of looking into the lives of others more than what we want to do, more than our lives. And so uh, I think that's, that's how I came here in a kind of a roundabout way. Mm. But, but I guess I'm, I'm also kind of interested in just, you know, the day-to-day -day operations. You seem to be, you know, super interested in plans and the role of drawings, but you're also physically drawing those things on the ground. You're, you know, you're, in a sense, you're, you're expanding. You're, you're not just limited to the role of the studio, the role of drawing, handing the drawings to a contractor and kind of, you know, so is that something that, that came about as a, uh, as a kind of, uh, reaction to the constraints of these projects, or is that a, just a means to get work done, or is it really a kind of conscious attempt to say that the role of the architect has to constantly be, you know, adjusting to the to those issues to be able to have any kind of effectiveness? All of them. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. Um, because I, I, my father is an engineer. I, I grew, I literally grew up in in construction sites. He used to take me there when I was very little. So I think construction is in my blood. I love construction. I feel very good when I go to construction mm -hmm. sites. And unlike in Western countries, you can still go to construction sites in, in back where I'm from. You can go there, you can change things. And I think that's the beauty of things because you, as your building is rising, you think, oh, could, could this be a little bit lower? Mm -hmm. And we, could, we can still do that. I mean, it's very difficult for you to do, but we can still do that. <laughs> and, um, and and not, not in all kinds of projects, but in projects in which uh, you know, the scale is small and we are you know, more involved in, in, in sort of raising funds, et cetera. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the things uh, to, be, to be involved with a, with a kind of a hands-on approach. The other thing is, um, I think, because I, I, don't, I, I don't use the computer. Hmm. I, I, I've learned AutoCAD and never, never did it. So I don't know how to, I draw with the hand. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I have people in my office who help me to translate those drawings into the digital. But as I, as I tell my students, you see the first line can never be on a screen. It's impossible. Because on the screen, the line is always firm. And, and in the, the first instance, you're of course confused. You don't know what you want. It, it's the sketch, right? But that, that period where you're not sure of what you want to do, I think that's important. That's the most important part because anything is possible. Everything is possible, not anything, but everything is possible. Um, so I think that I'm, I'm critical of that firm line with the pixels. And I think that line with the, with the charcoal or the pencil, I think it, it, it says to many, many things. And so uh, I, I really go to the firm line much later in, in, the, in the design stage. And uh, even after some models have been made. So I think that's, that's one approach we try to take. Hmm. Have, I'm curious if you found yourself doing something, whether in the field or, or your, your, um, your office has been doing something where you're, you look and it's like, how did I get here? Like, are there particular moments where it's like, how is it possible that I'm doing this, uh, that you never expected yourself to be doing it? You mean in a negative way? No, and I'm thinking more optimistic. Yeah, uh, really, you're good, in a good way. So, uh, yeah, I think sometimes. No, touch wood. I think I, I can imagine spaces. I mean, I'm, I've not been surprised. Very few times I thought that the scale I I imagined was less, hmm. and it turned out to be bigger, or it turned out to be more generous for the better. Uh, but touch wood, so far I have not had any surprises. When I went to the construction site or in a finished building, I was touch one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious, and this, this is going to sound like a softball question, but um, what are you working on now? Because the work, you've gotten more acclaim, your work has been in the context of Bangladesh. Are you getting asked to do work outside of the country? Um, 
would you want to take on that work? How do you, I, I'm curious about where you are within that global question that you brought up at the end. Yeah, so we have been invited to work in India, uh, but uh, as I said, I'm taking it slowly because we have to understand. I like what Glenn Market has always said. You know, he, he says, I know Australia, I cannot work anywhere else. Mm. And I think that's very important as opposed to so-called parachute architects who just drop in, do something, go out. Um, I, I don't think that works. And I would love to work elsewhere just to understand or to, to, to sort of research. But without that, I don't think it's possible. So it will take uh, some time for me to. We are doing a house in China, but uh, it's because there is an architect involved in that project who has invited me to work. So it's a different context. So that's why we're doing it there. Uh, in, in, in Bangladesh itself, we are doing um, a university, another university, not this one. Uh, we are making the country's um, first power management institute. Mm. It's a zero carbon, kind of, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting project for us. So, but also we are working on some very little project. We are working on a clinic uh, in a very remote location. So we try to make sure that we work at various scales and with various types of clients, even clients who cannot afford us as, as an office. Um, so, yeah. With, with so many of the projects being ones that you described as being pro bono, how, how, do, you, how do you afford that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very difficult. It's it's very difficult. I mean, we, we have had very lean periods uh, okay. throughout these 26 years, very difficult times as well. The pandemic had been very, very tough on us um, in terms of um, cash flow and stuff. But um, we, we I, I'm here, I'm still here. So <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask um, about the question of ruralism, which you've talked about and um, not seeing the rural as just being defined by the urban, somehow the urban being the kind of architect's domain and the rural is the area that, you know, we, we want to critique. But you've argued that the rural in Bangladesh has, has a kind of value. Um, I wonder if you could kind of elaborate on that a little bit, because I found that super interesting. Yeah, so we just always talk about this urbanism and, and this urban-centric thought and policies, but we, don't, we hardly talk about what's happening in the rural areas. It's just uh, people just leaving them. And, um, I, and so uh, because of what we try to achieve in the urban is already there in the rural in terms of fresh air, in terms of greenery, we try to put some plants in a building and say, well, it's a green building. Well, it may be literally a green building, but it's not really a green building. So uh, I think if you want green, it's there, it's there, out there. You don't have to work too hard to get it. And so, um, and also this reverse migration, I think it's already starting to happen in many countries. I think Switzerland is a very good, idea. It's a very good uh, case study uh, where they have very good infrastructure in terms of um, you know, media and other things and, and also access, very good train system and stuff. And so people can live in their houses miles or hundreds of miles away from centers, uh, city centers, uh, but still work uh, or, or commute every day or something. And I think, uh, the, well, it's a small country. Maybe that's why it's possible, but maybe we can uh, scale it up in, in some ways. And, um, and so the, the rural is where we need to concentrate. I always say, look, architects, those who can afford architects, I, I, we don't need to worry about them. We need to worry about people who cannot afford architects, who are not in touch with architects. For example, some of my clients here. And I think that's where our responsibility is to sort of go into those areas and try to do things which otherwise would not be done. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna open this up to uh, members of the audience. I don't know if there's a access to the online audience. Um, but okay, um, but uh, and uh, I, I want to. There's a note in your uh, in your your um, uh, Venice installation where you write, "To live is to be slowly born," and I've been trying to think about that one. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could unpack that. What do you mean by that? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it, it's it's a quote from Antoine de Saint Exupéry. Okay, but uh, it's basically, I think that's what we are doing. 
you see, in places like ours, it's very difficult to get things done. But then, then you really live it. Then you really appreciate the challenge of getting it done. You, you are really aware of what you're achieving. And I think when we go through the process, it, it really kills you because it takes so much time. Most of the projects that I've shown, it, it has taken five to seven years to build but uh, or more. But uh, once it's done, I think uh, th there's a kind of uh, sense of achievement, sense of involvement with the society because we are there so often, we're there for so long, interacting with them, making little changes, trying to understand the context. And I think that's how architecture should be. That's how architecture should operate. And I think I'm quite lucky to be operating in that kind of a context. Mm. Yeah. Um, one of the things that seems slightly like uh, even more challenging is the degree to which the um, the impacts of climate change are are accelerating and so legible within Bangladesh and the slow speed at which architecture takes place. Does how do how do you navigate those two contradictions? Right, that 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 to get a building built, the the terms are even the kind of the landscapes will have evolved in ways that the building may be too slow to deal with. Um, does that present any kind of, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's almost like talking about two different speeds. One that seems to be accelerating and then the architecture, which is so slow in its own, uh, its own realization. Yeah, but I think climate change, if, if I'm not wrong, is, is, is happening fast, but not that fast. Mm. I mean, we still have time. Mm. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, if we, if we start today, I'm saying, I mean, if we already, if we have already started, then, um, but, you know, it's not just us, it's just not in Bangladesh, but it's here, for example, in New York. And, and, you know, the hurricanes that's hitting the U.S. or has been hitting the U.S. with increasing frequency in the, in the last few years. And um, so I think it's everywhere, just like the pandemic, because it has shown us that everybody needs to be vaccinated or you're not safe. In the same way, I think we all need to be sort of into, um, in, into this idea of protecting or looking or caring for our natural environment. Otherwise, we're not safe. If we have... Um, you know, gases here, we're going to be affected there and vice versa. And so um, I think I think instead of panicking, the idea would be to sort of really, well, not to do things which sort of um, looks like a solution, but which are real solutions, mm -hmm. solutions which are, as I said, which takes into account the wisdom of our ancestors, of our older kind of societies, who have lived very well with nature. Even here, the, 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 the first so-called First Nation, they have lived very well. I mean, of course, there were much less people. Then. But you go to any continent, to Africa, to Asia, people have been quite, they have been kind to nature. Today, we are not. I think that's, that's the major difference. So um, I think we can look into this in that perspective. I'm not saying we need to be more primitive. But we just need to make sure that our priority is taking care of our environment. I think there's a there are a number of questions in the chat, um, and one ties into this, I think, which is what are your thoughts on educating architects, um, and how do we teach architects to uh, reconsider questions of design aesthetics in light of the climate and socio-ecological crises of our time? Well, I think architecture cannot be taught. Hmm. Basically, it, it can be inspired. I mean, I, I, when I go into a classroom, I, said, I say, I cannot teach you, but you can learn from me for, based on what I have done, based on my experience. And so um, I think it, 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 it's about conversations. It's about dialogue uh, within the, the classroom space as well as outside regarding climate change, because I don't really, I think there's one single solution or a set of solutions to, to the, the crisis that we are facing today. And I think there needs to be more and more ideas and newer ideas and, and, and it's possible through dialogue. It's possible through research and, and experimentation. Uh, but one thing's for sure, as I, I, was, I, was, I briefly touched on that, you see, since, the Greeks or the Egyptians, we have always talked about aesthetics, the, the golden section, blah, blah, blah. But today, 
I think composition aesthetics is a given. You know, it's all right. What we need to talk about today is the otherliness. We need to talk about the aesthetics of uh, responsible architecture, uh, aesthetics of response. How do we respond to that particular context? Does that place itself have a consciousness? Mm. Does it say, I want this and I don't want this? So if we can think in that line, maybe we can think about a new aesthetics after 2000 years, at least 2000 years. Mm. Because I think well, this idea of, you know, the Beaux-Arts and everything is fine, but I mean, we have been through all that. Mm. So in the 21st century, it needs to be a new aesthetic. Mm. How, much, how much do questions of materials come into play into this question of new aesthetics. I'm partially reacting to the, the degree to which the particulars of the materials influence the nature of the architecture in so many of the projects. Um, and uh, there's a question in the chat um, uh, that says many of your projects use local materials, yet these materials um, in certain cases require intensive energy to make them, concrete in particular. Um, how do you think the implications of the use of materials um, uh, will impact this question of global warming and what's the architect's responsibility in that context? Okay, so uh, in, in back where I work in, uh, we have a very limited kind of uh, palette of materials we can work in. It's not like here. Um, so uh, th there's limitation of only what we can do. But having said that, I have a different reason for using concrete and, and strong structure. It is because our climate is such that it is hot and humid. The, that is, is, is a deadly kind of combination for buildings. So we don't have a built heritage from uh, uh, you know, uh, earlier times. It has all, these are all in ruins because nothing has you know, survived. This, this deadly combination. And so I feel that whatever we build today, I think one of the aspects of sustainability is that the building sustains itself. It's, it's not built for 30 years and then you tear it down, you make something else. Because then again, no matter what your material is, you're still you know, using energy. Um, so I would rather make a building which would last or be in use for a hundred years if possible. So think it through and make it in a more responsible way. But for, for me, I think I'm also trying to contribute to the built heritage. And I know it sounds big, but if you go to our country, you don't, I, I cannot show you buildings which are older than 300 years. I cannot. Mm. Although, as I said, um, there were um, ruins which go back to two and a half thousand years or, or even more. But um, so it's difficult. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that I used materials which are strong and we build it well. And our structures are well thought out, um, you know, for the, not today's codes, but which may come in later, considering uh, earthquakes and everything. It's also interesting to note that you can do aerial photography of your, your buildings and not have to worry about showing too many air conditioning units because mm -hmm. I don't. I have a suspicion that many other projects are not air conditioned, right? Um, which and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of kind of natural ventilation and and or let me reverse that the role of mechanical uh, ventilation and its absence uh, within some of your work. Yeah. So because we're in a tropical climate, um, we can afford to open our windows. Uh, in summer and in winter. And um, so I think that's, that's something we need to focus on. And because humidity is such a thing, it feels very nice when you have an air conditioning going on and it decreases your you know, humidity level. It's very comforting. But if you're, you know, I say people are in their in air conditioned homes, going to their air conditioned offices in air conditioned cars, living an air conditioned life, but that's, that's, you know, that's not good for your health. Um, so what is better is to have natural cross ventilation, air going in and going out, taking away the humidity, taking away the sweat and whatever. And, and that's a much better way of living. And that's what we try to do in, in our projects. Now, some of our clients 
ask for air conditioning and we have to work in a roundabout way, try to convince them. And later on, they realize they don't really need air conditioning anymore because it's, it's quite comfortable. Yeah, and, and one of the projects you didn't show was uh, an apartment building where you line the perimeter of the apartment building with very deep balconies and shading devices precisely so that you yes. could, could mitigate the kind of yes. need for, for mechanical systems. So, yes. um, uh, I kind of want to make sure I'm not, I include as many questions from the audience as possible. Uh, if there are questions, please, I guess the mic is down here. Um, and uh, this is, yeah, so the lights are actually quite bright. So I'm, I'm making sure I can see out there properly, so. I, I just wanted to follow up on the climate change conversation. I was so moved by your response to the cyclone. And I was just, <clears throat> I thought the listening tour was just beautiful to hear. Uh, so when you show this map of, million people having to leave the coast of Bangladesh by mid-century. Uh, do you see architects operating in that time scale? And like, uh, has your practice started to talk about, you know, like the migration pattern that might happen in new cities or new places to live or the adaptation in place for that population? Well, we are, we are, I'm, I'm working on a book uh, which sort of, talks about these things, but if truth be told, I don't think there is a solution because uh, where Bangladesh is very flat. There is only a rise of about 45 feet in all of the country. It's that flat. And uh, that's why the, the rising oceans are, are a genuine kind of a threat uh, because five feet and half of the country is down. And um, and this is the same. It's even worse in the Maldives, for example, and of course the Pacific Islands. Um, but we we engage in a lot of conversations, and I said um, we're trying to understand. But it's a very densely populated country, and that's where the problem is. Mm. Where do you take them? There's there's nowhere else. I mean, it's there's no empty kind of prairies where we can take them. Um, so if just to give you an idea, if we were to follow the density of Bangladesh, we could fit the entire population of the world into the area of the United States. The entire population of 7 billion people into the United States, if we follow the density of Bangladesh. So that many people. So um, there isn't a direct solution and I don't think anybody has it at the moment. And also the problem is, as you have seen, the, uh, the rivers, they, they crisscross like veins into the land. So it's not easy to make embankments or like approaches that have sort of adopted in, um, in uh, the Netherlands, for example. So uh, it's a very difficult uh, situation. Um, one of the things you mentioned was that, you know, in the places that you work, you can kind of change a building as it's going up, where it, as in New York City, it's very like, very prim and proper and you have to follow the construction drawings. So is there any place or, or way that we can kind of implement these design principles into a city like New York, where everything is so strict and regulated? Well, I should say that it's very similar in that way. When we build in the urban areas, it's also very strict and, you know, codes and approvals and um, it's the same, but um, we, we negotiate. We negotiate with the client, with the contractor. So it's easier with the rural projects, but in the city, of course, it's, it's more difficult. But I think Khan, for example, is very well known for going to sites and saying, oh, could we do this and do that, that sort of thing. And I think it's important. You know that uh, his, his, his building in, in Dhaka, the parliament building had no roof as it was going up. So I don't know how the structure was over-designed or not, but the roof that you see now was not completely designed when the building had already started, the foundations were already done. So that's not possible today, I understand. But that structure is also not possible today. That's, that's one magnificent structure. 
and it's possible because he was able to work on that project for what uh, 12 years or, so, or nine years at least so i think it's important to have that kind of freedom for architects that then they can really work as artists as well i mean meaningful way but uh, i also appreciate that it's 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 dangerous uh, so we have to follow the codes and yeah for new york i, I don't know it's much more complicated mm -hmm. no i want to thank you i i think the work oh wait sorry is there no please please so Hi, I didn't realize I came here to cry. I'm very inspired. <laughs> like, I have napkins. Um, I'm not um, into the, the architectural space, so hopefully this question, I can like word it the right way, but I'm curious, I really like how you all look for opportunities to hire locals and the handmade bricks and all that. Um, my interest is more in a super Adobe, you know, uh, that kind of building with clay bricks and things of that nature and trying to find a way to make it work in upstate New York, mixing it with concrete. And so um, I'm just curious if there are more, if there are other earthen building styles that are happening in Bangladesh, whether it be with hemp or um, super adobe. I mean, super adobe would be tough because of the humidity, but I'm just curious if there is and how I can learn more and continue to cry and be inspired apparently, so. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, so um, in Bangladesh, um, there have been um, rammed earth buildings. Many people have tried also uh, unbaked bricks. But as I've said, because of my preoccupation with trying to contribute to the built heritage and to make sure that buildings last, because I think for me, first step towards sustainability is to make sure that the investment is over a longer period then you it's simple maths so um and because of the flooding and because of the heavy rain i think adobe is 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 a challenging uh, kind of a material to work with and i know that many people are doing it but i think it's more of an experiment or i look at it as a luxury material if you ask me yeah it's it's, it's the luxury of designing something you just want to design. I, I don't have that luxury. I, I have to be more pragmatic. I have but that's, to, that's specific to the climate. And to the climate, Russia, yeah. to the climate. Yeah. Here it would be very different, but um, yeah, I can imagine. But I, th I think we need to follow the clues. You see, if you, if you look at Adobe, it's probably in, in you know, New Mexico and places like that, because there's a reason. There's a reason why they chose to build like that, to keep things cool. In, in a hot, dry climate. And it's the same thing in Yemen, for example, or in Egypt, because of the same, it's the same climate. I think it's the climate and then comes the culture and then comes the built kind of environment or the built heritage. So I think if you follow the trail of the climate, I think it's better. Hmm. So wherever you're building, if it's that kind of a weather, then it's fine. But if it's a different kind, then it's a challenge whether it will work or not, whether gaps in the, in, the, in the clay is going to freeze up and crack, I don't know. So, um, so I think the best clue is, the, is nature. So if you follow nature, I think we, we will take the right decision. Hmm. Ah, I am going to thank you for um, the work, the thinking, um, the arguments of the aesthetics of responsibility that you put on the table at the end, um, and in general, um, the, the level, uh, uh, the breadth of the architecture that operates between questions of value, extreme constraints, and produces spaces that I think are truly extraordinary. So thank you for being here. Thank you.